Nomi for that nice introduction. And thanks everybody for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. I did speak on LinkML for a short, a short talk um, this summer in Lyon, and it's nice to see you all again today. Um, as Nomi mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about a tool that we've developed a framework for mo data modeling called LinkML and try to tie it in with some of the questions that we often get about how I use ontologies to, how I as a, as a researcher use ontologies to annotate my data and how LinkML can help here. So I think um, maybe some of you have seen this slide before, but I think as data scientists and bioinformaticians and even subject matter experts, biologists, we would really, really save a lot of time if our data was shaped like this, if we had clearly labeled attributes and if we were really shooting for the moon, we just had to deal with numbers. <laughs> Everybody used the same units. Everyone would record the same attributes. Our data would be very easy to compare, easy to ingest and easy to use to find uh, interesting findings outside of the research we're currently doing ourselves. But of course, you know, Quantitative biomedical knowledge and biological knowledge is really complex. Um, it's not necessarily relational. There are a lot of connections and um, components that shut on and off, right? We have thousands of named entities and terms, hundreds of thousands actually. And most of our knowledge, just to be fair, is still um, in unstructured formats like literature, figures, lab notebooks, spreadsheets. And that can make it kind of difficult to to interoperate with. So for example, this is a real life data example that we just uh, we just dealt with in the National Microbiome Data Collaborative. Uh, it's another project that our group works on. And you can see that, you know, this is this is real data, right? It's it's captured in a spreadsheet. It has sort of unstandardized variables. It doesn't use global IDs. There's sort of free text categorical information here, which means that we could enter any number of, of data there without any kind of validation. We have these really wide sparse tables with hundreds of variables and no units. And what that leads to is either having to write interfaces that help us validate the data as we see it, or a, a lot of, of disparate data getting entered into fields that we would hope would be harmonized, right? So it can be easy to parse um, TSV data or spreadsheet data if it's normalized in the spreadsheet, but we often see sort of a mix of metadata about what const constitutes an object, even typed by the color of the cell. And the consumers of the data are, are usually not the same people that captured or recorded the data. So there's often this layer of interpreting the data, both temporally and spatially, that's dis disparate from the data generators. So what we end up with is kind of this tangled web of data as it migrates through our different systems. Um, and sometimes, you know, the documentation between each of these curly transforms isn't as robust as we need it to be, right? And sometimes um, when we're left with these spreadsheets or these data sets, it doesn't have to be a spreadsheet, of course, that aren't completely um, consistent with in terms of identifier management, we, we tend to proliferate our identifiers, right? Um, and so if you look in fairsharing.org, which is a great way to find existing standards and existing databases with data in it that we can share, uh, we have tons of databases. We have over 1,800 of them. And, and while we're trying to do better here, we have done better. We've we've developed lots and lots of standards, 1,500. And according to BioPortal, we have more than 900 ontologies that tries to classify our domains into reusable standards. But you know, even though this is getting a lot better, it's still hard to follow. <clears throat> and so that has real consequences for us on a micro level. As data scientists, we spend a lot of time in development, cleaning and structuring and restructuring our data in order to interoperate. And on the macro level, we you know, may be missing out on treatments for patients or on microbial effects on climate change or the real heart of this data cloud that we're, we're all collecting independently and we wanna to try to make change um, with interoperating over all the data. So, um, what can we do differently? And that's sort of the heart of my talk. And I'm gonna start with three main things that I think we've learned over the course of doing this in several different communities. We wanna start with ontologies and that's what I'm gonna talk about first. We're gonna to try to reuse and contribute to existing efforts when we can. We're then gonna take our implicit models that are described by these you know, kinds of data structures that maybe don't have enough documentation with them. And we're gonna make them explicit. And this is where I'll introduce LinkML. And then I think importantly, after we talk about those two ends of a data pipeline, just give you some ideas and lessons that we've learned from the recent and um, ever increasing adoption of LinkML over the course of the last year or two. 
Okay, so and I think the best way to introduce some of these concepts is by using an example. And I'm a software developer, as, as Nomi said at the beginning, and um, so giving this giving a software developer the the uh, the job of creating a biological data set um, is is always entertaining. So so give me some slack here, but and it's and it's just a made up set, but it it sort of hopefully illustrates the points that I'm trying to make about this side of the data pipeline. Um, so we have three researchers here. They're all sampling microbial data from um, bodies of water in Oregon. It's where I'm from. We have one looking at a lake called Lake Albert, one looking at the Pacific Ocean, Oregon borders the Pacific Ocean, and uh, Crater Lake, um, which is uh, the largest national park in Oregon. Um, and the fourth researcher here down at the bottom just really wants to reuse this data. She wants to look at the data across all these data sets. Um, and as a consumer, you know, she wants to ask these questions, you know, uh, can I compare bacterial compositions of different bodies of water? Can I compare bacterial compositions from different depths? And, you know, how, how can I limit my comparison to those that are only taken from salt water or even further taken from just the zone of water that, um, you know, um, is, is receptive to light, the epipelagic zone? Um, and so the first thing she has to do, right, as we've all done before, is really remove the, dis dis the disambiguity uh, between the data sets by typing them um, according to their titles. And so as a researcher who's looking at, at water in Oregon, she can kind of say, well, the, the title of this data set is Lake Albert. I, I'm assuming it's a lake. The ocean, of course, is an ocean and Crater Lake is a lake. But you know she's kind of stuck there, right? She she has to codify her knowledge by probably googling or looking into it, um, and then she asks herself sort of like, what makes something a lake? And if I had, and you know, if she had a, a lab full of people, how does she know that one of her grad students is characterizing a body of water the same way she is? And do we all have the same definition of a lake? Is a lake, you know, a pond that I built in my backyard, or does it have to have dirt and be created by? Uh, I don't know, a crater or something like that, right? So she she sort of asked herself how I disambiguate all of these different kinds of lakes, although it is getting better here that now she can compare <clears throat> data across the data sets. And, you know, this is where all of us in this meeting would, would suggest she go and look up uh, the work that has been done previously by many experts on defining sort of a controlled vocabulary or an ontology for uh, describing what these environments could be, and you know, there's a hierarchy here. We would we encourage her to go to the ontology lookup service or BioPortal and just enter in those terms, lake, ocean, and see the definition that folks have come up with for these bodies of water. Look for synonyms, cross references. Make sure the definition is formalized, and point all of her students and collaborators to it. And then, you know, she has the option of sharing this data with other people that use these ontologies and be able to iterate through it. Um, consistently, <clears throat> right? So she spends some time with the ontology lookup service and she finds the common ontology, the environment ontology, and she notices right away that she can be more specific about typing her data sets. <clears throat> she even finds one uh, term in the ontology, the marine photic zone, and that describes the exact kind of region of the water body that she wants to work with. So she knows that in the ontology, marine photic zone is defined as the X um, depth of the water, and it's where the water can uh, be influenced by light, right? So she can type this Pacific Ocean data set by looking at the depth here and looking at the ontology as being a sample from the marine photic zone. Um, but what she doesn't find necessarily is that <clears throat> there is a freshwater photic zone, right? So she doesn't see that in the ontology. She's looked around, and if you kind of, it's a little hard to see here, but in this square box, when she, when she navigates down to um, uh, the ontology, the marine photic zone, she sees that it's mapped directly to a spire term for epipelagic zone. And so there is some knowledge in this ontology that those epipelagic zones exist, but she would have to then go to the, a very useful resource, the Open Biological and Biomedical Ontology Foundry, look up the Envo ontology find on GitHub where it's being managed and the group of experts that is hosting that and maybe even find her way to Slack and meet Nico and the rest of us who um, are are talking about these different terms. And it would be wonderful if she submitted a, a pull request or a ticket to add that uh, freshwater photic zone to the ontology. 
And in this way, we don't encourage people to make their own ontologies, right? We don't want her to start from scratch just because she can't find the freshwater photic zone. We'd really want her to go and contribute to the shared understanding of these things um, and decrease the crisis of interoperability that we're seeing happen um, with our data, right? And it's super important to do this because the domain experts that manage these ontologies really use the you know, cutting edge research that's happening in biology all the time to influence and evolve the ontologies they work with. So um, it's a great benefit to ontology developers to have subject matter experts come and, and provide their feedback into these ontologies to make them better. Um, and as we know, you know, ontology development can be very labor intensive, right? You're, you're not only dealing with the, the manual labor of making changes to uh, a complicated um, a vocabulary of terms, but you're also researching and figuring out all the different nuances of the definition of a term, how it relates to other terms, maybe even restructuring the ontology. And so sometimes from a research point of view, you know, you can say, I submitted my GitHub ticket to this ontology a long time ago, and finally it's here, right? And, you know, the Obo Foundry, you know, um, has a lot of processes in place to help this go faster and help you make a good ticket and also ensure that the changes made to the ontology are consistent and logically coherent. Um, but we still have some long queues here. So um, I, I want to point out that, uh, yeah, there, there might be all these open tickets, but look at all the closed ones too, right? So we're doing a good job, but it sometimes takes a long time. And the ontology developers are well aware of that. And I just wanted to put a small plug in for um, you know, some of the work we've been doing in our group to sort of streamline the process of uh, ontology term requests, at least trying to take some of the burden um, from, from simple changes to the ontology off of human eyes in the first place and, and, and making them more automated. So we developed a tool called Ontobot and um, it's instantiated in production in BioPortal. You can kind of use the UI to request a new synonym or remove an existing synonym or obsolete a class. And what Ontobot does is it generates GitHub issue and it, a GitHub pull request, which is then sort of, um, you know, reviewed by an ontology expert. Um, but at the same time, it sort of does the hard work of getting that into the into the queue faster. And then, of course, with the harder issues, we don't we don't pass them through a robot. We've all seen what AI can do, right? <laughs> we get those to experts. But there is some work coming to make this process easier. <clears throat> So, and despite those downsides and the long queues and all the work that goes into that ontology development and reuse side of this data equation we've been talking about is really quite great, right? Where there's reuse going on, there's thousands of high quality curated annotations made every year using ontologies. And in between ontologies, there's plenty of reuse going on as well. So HP uses Kebi and the cell ontology, Go uses sequence ontology, et cetera. So, what, what can we attribute this success to? And I think like two things we can note right off the bat is that, you know, ontology communities are open and collaborative and deeply invested in developing tooling and education materials to help streamline the process of categorizing biology into these formal um, vocabularies. And we always were trying really hard to um, to improve our understanding of the domain. And we can just really thank the Obo Foundry for much of this work and we can learn from their example on the other side of the data pipeline um, if we wanna try to solve the other half of this data puzzle. Um, so go, moving on to the second part of my talk, I wanna talk about, you know, are ontologies enough? When we've annotated our data with a shared understanding of the underlying knowledge structures of what we're trying to express, have we done enough to uh, make our data interoperable? And so we're going to go back to our simple and silly example. Just again, bear with me. So she's our researcher, our data scientist has effectively used Envo to type the data correctly so that she can navigate it uh, using the ontology. But she really needs to compare uh, samples at different depths. And and quite off the bat, off the bat, you can really clearly see that the depth column in the second data set on the right here is is a mix of inches and feet and on the left it's a mix of centimeters and again i'm just going to pull up what we found in a real data set um you know this can be very very this can be a highly variable uh set of of data <clears throat> so um you know i think what um, the point i'm trying to make here is that models for our data are really hiding 
in these kind of data sets in plain sight. These are standards, they are models, but they're not machine actionable. And it really takes a human to interpret it, interpret the values. I don't have, as a researcher trying to combine these data sets, I don't have metadata to know that all the values in the depth column for one data set are feet. I don't know if the bacteria column in the Crater Lake data uh, sample holds a list or a single bacteria with a comma in the name. I, I honestly would have to write my own validator so that the assumptions I make about tagging the data and cleaning it fit the pattern throughout the entire data set. Some of these data sets can be very huge. And so, you know, it's not enough to be able to um, use ontologies to tag our data. We really need to be able to understand the way the annotation fits within the context uh, of the rest of the data. And, um, you know, moving to an uh, even further challenge that we've all experienced, right? even when you're using a modeling framework that might express more metadata about your data, data set, it doesn't necessarily lead you to share that with someone else using the exact same modeling framework, right? So let's say that we move to the next step and this wasn't just a spreadsheet, it was a SQL database, right? For both of these data sets, you can see they have very similar attributes, they have similar column names, but right here, depth on the left is a float and depth on the right is a foreign key. So yet again, I'm gonna, as a human, have to understand why that's a foreign key. Is it pointing to a controlled vocabulary? I'm gonna have to look at the data itself to understand. Um, and it's all sort of documented. These transformations are often documented in code. So you have the usual sort of communication trappings of a game of telephone where you're trying to trace what the transformation has been to harmonize the data all the way through your system and between systems. <clears throat> Right. And so, you know, to further complicate things, you're saying here, well, like what what modeling framework should I use then if, if it, you know, if I can't use a spreadsheet and I don't use the SQL, what do you what do you what do you want here? And and the truth is we have a wealth of different modeling language that we speak across the domain. And depending on the hat you wear and what kind of research you're doing, the technologies that we're familiar with, we kind of decide what technology we implement in order to interoperate. And, um, you know, some of the things that go into that decision are, does the technology have a community of people willing to support it? Is the community moving towards a feature or benefit of one technology over another? Is it an active development? And there's a learning curve to all these stacks. And oftentimes you have people in your group that are both subject matter experts and software developers, and that communication is really important. Um, uh, to, to like decrease the time it takes to annotate the data and also use it downstream. Um, right, so honestly, we, we really want tools that uh, lower the learning curve here and have people focus on the important work of modeling the data rather than learning the technology that structures it. <clears throat> so getting to the point, LinkML is what we, what we sort of like to think of as a, a universal com converter box. And so what we're trying to do with LinkML is make implicit schemas explicit and be agnostic or even parasitic, I would say, about existing data model frameworks. We're gonna use the ones that are out there and fit into the places where, in our technology stacks where we can with a more explicit model than is there now. And um, you know, really making an open data ecosystem that builds on the foundation we see in the Oboe Foundry or in our open ontologies to do the same thing for data models that we've done for ontologies. And so what do I mean by universal converter box? Well, we want, like I said before, we really want people to collaborate on the model. That's the hard work here and not have to focus necessarily on all the technologies in order to collaborate. Um, we want to streamline this model development. So we, in a LinkML model, we create the model in a simple yet highly annotated YAML format. Um, and though I'll show a tool later on in the presentation that we wrote that actually abstracts the model development itself back into a spreadsheet. So meeting people where they are in terms of model development is really important to us. Um, and then we take the ontology development approach and capture mappings to other models, rich descriptions for both classes and attributes of our model and reuse, the link, reuse existing models where we can and then compile the model we develop into other modeling frameworks so that our model fits easily in existing technology pipelines and we can share with others. So LinkML can create JSON schema, it can create RDF, it can create SQL data definition language, um, you can even throw it into a, a CSV. <clears throat> But, you know, LinkML is not just a Python package that translates models into different modeling serializations. It also contains a rich meta metadata model for describing model components, 
and a suite of tools to help convert instance data between those model serializations. Uh, for example, you can convert a TSV to a JSON file that might be more structured and easy to parse downstream. You also can generate Python and Pydantic data model data classes from YAML and infer the schema from instance data. So if I have this whole big spreadsheet of, 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 of lake samples, I could actually run it through a tool we have in LinkML called the Schema Automator and extract from it what, um, what we think would be the data model for that data, really trying to make that implicit data model explicit. We also have validators that, again, parasitize existing frameworks. So in this case, you know, if you had uh, a, a LinkML YAML file and you, you uh, serialized it as JSON schema using our tools, then you could use a JSON schema validator to do the first pass validation before laying on more complex instance validation um, uh, down the road. So um, I think first we should probably dive in a little bit deeper to the left side of this slide where we define the language that we use to model in LinkML. And sometimes the way, the easiest way of course to learn is to compare to existing framework that you might know better than the others. So I may know SQL very, very well, and I might even have plenty of experience translating SQL into an object relational mapping like Hibernate so I can generate Java classes. But you know, maybe my new organization really speaks RDF, or it speaks Python, or it speaks, uh, you know, OWL. <clears throat> and so what I can do is I can write a model in LinkML, use the transformers to spit out um, a different serialization of my model, and I can check that what I'm doing as a modeler fits into my existing technological headspace of how I understand models to work. And this slide just sort of illustrates how the different serializations look. Um, coming from, from LinkML. So in LinkML, we, we talk about classes and slots, um, the, same, uh, the same concepts in SQL. In a relational database might be a table and a column. In JSON schema, those might be objects and properties. You know, in Python, there's classes and, and variables or um, et cetera. So you might have an object property, an owl, for example, and a class. Um, so these are all just terms that we can kind of interoperate over to help democratize schema development and make the focus on turning those implicit models to be explicit. Okay, so going back to our very familiar now, Pacific Ocean Sample Database, I've added a few more columns here to better describe the sample that was taking place. And I'm sort of showing on the, on the right how these translate into a LinkML YAML file. And if we think of one row in this uh, spreadsheet as an instance of an entire class of data, we can kind of easily extract that this data set is about um, a higher level sample. It's a sample of data. So we're gonna call that a class in LinkML. One of the features of LinkML that I really like that I think is sort of undervalued with the more complex modeling language support that we have is just the description of the class. If you've ever written a, a SQL schema, you know it's really hard to write a description on a table without extra software um, to help you support that without a whole nother layer of, of schema UML. Um, so in LinkML, you can write that description for every class that we write. You can also write a description for every attribute or slot that you put in your model. And that really helps communicate between different expertise, you know, a software engineer or, or a subject matter expert, what you really mean by this class of data. We can also specify in LinkML whether something is multi-valued, so we never have to guess whether or not that comma is part of the name, or if it means that there's more than one species that was sampled here, for example, in this example. We can also say which parts of our model, our implicit model here are required. So if I ever find a type value in my data set that is null, I can easily write a validator or use some of the validators that LinkML provides to generate an error. <clears throat> Okay, and going a little bit further than that, um, you know, not only does LinkML give the basic modeling framework bits that you would find in any modeling language, but it really tries to incorporate the work already done by ontologists to specify domains. So when you're writing a data model here, we want uh, people to reuse the knowledge in ontologies, and we give them several ways to do that. Um, if you can see on the right here, I've kind of labeled these two ontologies that I'm highlighting with colors. The green one is Envo and the orange one is Peito. Um, on the depth attribute of our biosample set here, you can see that I've used a modeling component called slot URI. 
and I've set it to an environment ontology term. And that is really a uh, key to our serialization code in LinkML to translate. Um, when I'm translating into RDF, for example, it's going to extract that slot URI and give the definition of that attribute exactly the definition and the identifier of that Envo term. So I'm literally reusing an identifier here to describe what I mean by depth. And since that's already been described in Envo, we're really reusing the work of many here to, to describe our model. Another way to do that in this one is, is shown by the, the orange Pato um, identifier here on the right. And that's through mappings to other ontologies. A really big part of LinkML and any model is to say, my definition of salinity in this case is exactly the same as your definition of salinity in Pato. So I, if I don't want to be as prescriptive as giving the identifier of Envo to my depth column as I was before, I just want to say that really the definition of salinity here is exactly the same as the one in Pato. I can do that as well. Um, and I just wanted to point out another, another thing down here. If you look at the type field, it's highlighted in yellow. You can see that in the LinkML, I've actually specified another class here called sample type. And if you look a little bit further down, there's this enums section of our LinkML model that defines sample type as an enumeration that has values that are reachable from the ontology of Envo. So what this means is that any kind of serialization of the model, any kind of validation, any kind of transformation here says that the, the values in my sample type column have to be from the Envo ontology, which gives us a really clear way of restricting um, uh, the the range of that of that uh, column in the model. Okay, so uh, another really fun thing about LinkML models um, is that you can import them from other LinkML models. So if my two researchers actually knew about LinkML and they're both using it to model their data, my Pacific Ocean sample database might have a biosample class in LinkML, <clears throat> and my lake sample. Um, database might might want to use some of the attributes from this biosample class from this external researcher um, to represent their lake samples. A lot of the, the attributes are the same. So what you can do is import that other biosample data uh, model from the LinkML model of the other group, and you can use it in, a, in the hierarchical definition of your sample. So here, just uh, I'm getting caught up in my words. Basically, let's look at the code. Uh, lake sample here imports the biosample class that we just talked about. And through the is a metadata co uh, component, we can really say that this lake, sa lake sample is a biosample, which means it has all the attributes of biosample. Um, but I can also extend that class. So in this case, I'm showing you how in the lake sample, the slot usage um, key over on the right a little bit is really specifying that uh, not only do I have depth, but I have depth units in my lake, lake sample, and those units must be constrained to the string of centimeters. So I can extend and also inherit from other LinkML models. And I, I, of course, don't have enough time to talk about the entirety of our meta model, so I'm just going to put a plug in for our tutorial. And um, if you're interested in learning more about the meta model, please just go ahead and take the tutorial, and, and, and um, hopefully that will help you see some of the more um, complicated modeling parameters that we have. Um, and as I sort of have mentioned a couple of times before, this is kind of looking at the second half of LinkML, it has the meta model where we describe our data, but it also has built in tools to use with it. Uh, it has built in validators, for example. I mentioned this before, you can take adjacent, serializ adjacent schema serialization of your model and pass it through our validator uh, and really have a built in way to ingest data into your model. Uh, with a really popular and familiar um, technology like JSON schema. And uh, let's see next. There we go. Uh, we also have developed tooling um, to help you take a LinkML model <clears throat> and write familiar code to uh, do manual data entry into your model. So this is a tool called Data Harmonizer, where underneath this sort of like spreadsheet looking uh, interface, we have a LinkML model that, you know, specifies the controlled vocabularies used for column four, and it has uh, re uh, regular expressions in the model itself that define how, you know, column two is added, and it has all the good implicit documentation of a LinkML model, but it also spins up this sort of web-based cell spreadsheet that people can enter data into and get live validation. 
there's been additional work on data tooling using LinkML from James Overton, uh, data harmonization from Damian Dooley's group. And there's another tool called Valve or Nanobot that James Overton wrote that also can take a LinkML schema and provide sort of like a table-based data entry um, tool to enter data according to the schema. <clears throat> right. And, you know, you can also, I mentioned this before, generate LinkML from spreadsheets. So if I have that really simple Pacific Ocean data set and I don't know how to interpret all of the data, I can actually run it through a schema automator, which is what we provide from LinkML. And it's going to pop out a LinkML YAML from what it can infer from the data itself. Uh, and make you a base level schema that you can start with. <clears throat> and you know this is um, this is not an easy process, right? It's not an easy process to automate. So I would uh, I would you know encourage you to try it out if you had a bunch of models that you wanted to try to make here from spreadsheets or from JSON schema it can also be run through the schema automator, but use it as a baseline and then um, annotate as you see fit going forward. <clears throat> Right. And so we talked a little bit about at the beginning how important documentation was. I think I mentioned previously that the description of attributes is also super important in communicating models across uh, different domains and also across different people in your organization, depending on their expertise. <clears throat> and one of the things I like a lot about LinkML is that, you know, it has tooling to auto generate documentation from the mo from the model documentation you write. So you're writing documentation once and you're distributing it again. Uh, in different ways for people to see. So it's written in the model, you distribute it to GitHub, and you can have these nice read the docs or, you know, your own styling, you can add on top of this, you don't have to have read the docs, you can use make docs, etc. But it takes those model annotations and describes them um, in an easy to read document format. We also have UML diagrams that are generated on the fly for you. Um, and we can kind of look at the hierarchy, the class hierarchy in the model in a visual way. <clears throat> Right, so there's lots of other uh, features and I probably don't have time to go into all of them today, but we talked a little bit about lots of them. So LinkML, the modeling language itself has the ability to, to do inheritance and polymorphism. We have a rule language that can uh, allow you to write complex expressions, Boolean, conditioning, con Boolean conditionals and pattern matching for any of your slots or attributes in your model. Um, we have almost done first class support for n dimensional arrays. We have a lot of additional tools, right? I talked a little bit about how we can use validators in LinkML um, by parasitizing other frameworks. We also have, you know, other more complicated validation going on as well. Um, it's your choice whether or not to use that, of course. We have um, the ability to generate a whole bunch of different kinds of model serializations. Um, and, you know, we even have a project generator script called the LinkML Project Cookie Cutter. So if you're interested in writing a new model in LinkML, you can use that cookie cutter to establish a GitHub repository that has all these things sort of in, inherently built for you. <clears throat> and all you have to do is write the YAML and you can, um, you can generate all of this for your model as well. Most recently, we introduced a LinkML linter. LinkML was written, you know, in a sort of <clears throat> what we call post postelian way. We try to make it as easy as possible to write those YAML files. Um, and then we kind of convert it to the best practices of each model serialization. But what we found is that folks really like to have a standard way of writing uh, LinkML consistently. So we have a, an optional LinkML linter that you can kind of run your schema through and see if it matches the best practices for uh, schema development that we've identified that we like, right? So for example, class names in LinkML should be camel case and slot names should, be, should have underscores. <clears throat> Right, so if we just sort of summarize, you have two sides of the data pipeline that we see, right? You have the, the annotation and description of your data using ontologies. And then on the other side, you have LinkML to make those implicit models explicit. And of course, voila, simple to say, now we can discover all the things. Um, and in fact, we've really done this in practice. We've tried this out and um, Nomi mentioned at the beginning that one of the projects I'm involved in is the BioLink model. And uh, that's being developed in concert with the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS. Uh, the project is put in place to sort of bring together um, biological and biomedical data from over 350 independent data sources 
And that data ranges from genomic data to you know, ontologies to chemical data to drug and indication data, phenotype and disease expression, cellular studies. Uh, and BioLink was made as a model to uh, help harmonize all of that independent data into one data structure or one data model, I should say. And LinkML was developed as a, a way to ex express that um, shared or unified data model across all these different groups. <clears throat> And in fact, we just released the user interface for um, uh, querying across all these 350 sources in a federated way using BioLink as the basis of the communication pl platform between all those different sources. So you can go into the URL here and you can type in things like what drugs may treat um, a disease and you'll be seeing data from all these different federated sources harmonized with one model, the, the BioLink model. Um, but we're not the only ones that adopted it for ourselves. The <clears throat> adoption rate of LinkML is really growing. I think this slide is out of date. Um, we have some of the same drivers for the Obo Foundry involved in making this truly an open source and welcoming and empowering community. So we really value having lots of input from the community. We have community meetings that we host every month. We have a Slack channel. Of course, we have um, you know, email listserv, all sorts of different things and ways to get involved. And we've seen a real uptake in uptick in uh, community development of this uh, standard as well. <clears throat> so I think we could probably share some lessons learned from this rapid uptake in LinkML adoption. And, and is there anything that we would do differently? Um, and as I sort of mentioned just now, really, we're trying to follow the model of the the Obo Foundry and this open biomedical ontologies to make the other end of this data pipeline um, more open as well. So we know that data models are really foundational in application development. We know that there's a lot of talk that goes on even within a single organization between the layers of your application. So you might have a data model that represents the database then you have another data model that slightly changes to represent the API or communication layer between your data. You might even have another data model that represents how you show your data to users, even within one organization. And LinkML is very aware of that. And we tr we're trying very hard with those different serializations of the model to decrease those, those change points along the system um, and decrease the communication errors that sometimes can happen. Um, but we really want to provide tools that make open source development and GitHub easy. I mentioned the LinkML project cookie cutter uh, that will spin up a GitHub repository for you for LinkML sort of by default. And, you know, um, <clears throat> what we have really learned from this is that the processes and product lifecycle for open source tools really must include members outside of the funded team um, because it's um, a tool that's going to need more funding and more development than even one project can provide. It's it's a high use system, and we need to include people that can develop um, their particular serialization or their particular section of this model um, really coherently um, and and quickly. <clears throat> All right. So um, the second lesson we've kind of learned is that. Uh, <clears throat> that examples are really critical in understanding a modeling framework. And they're also really critical in conveying a particular model to other people. And so we really started introducing over the last course of the year, a lot over the course of the last year, um, an example forward design. And so in LinkML, in a standard LinkML repository, you're going to have all sorts of uh, built-in tools that allow you to write actual um, examples of your data and have those run through tests in your model so that if something changes in the model, you're going to get a test failure, for example. And those test failures are going to be reflective of your examples. So again, we're trying to limit the number of things you have to write in terms of documentation, but also uh, really express how you want your model to look um, in, a, in, a, in a way that a downstream user would be able to, to understand it. Um, Right. And so, and then the far, the, the, the last thing that we've sort of learned, and this is development that's ongoing uh, in LinkML. These are very beta uh, tools that I'm going to talk about, but, you know, models need to iterate just like, um, you know, just like code needs to iterate. We shouldn't let the perfection be the enemy of good with our models, good enough with our models, right? So we need to put something out there and make sure we can interoperate with a lot of different systems 
And then we need to change it when biology changes. And so we have a tool called the LinkML Transformer. It uses the knowledge graph change language to help document the transform between an existing model and the endpoint of an evolved model. And you define the grammar in LinkML just the same way you're going to make a schema change. It's kind of like a existing relational database tools like Flyway or Liquibase, if you're familiar with those, um, where you can use to you can use the language to transform your model into another model. <clears throat> Okay, so those are some things that we're doing going forward. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a huge team of people that make LinkML po uh, possible. We have the, the folks at Berkeley BOP um, and the, the TS Lab for doing a lot of the work in this model modeling framework. And of course, thank you to the NIH for funding so much of this work. Uh, we do have monthly community meetings. We have a Slack channel. We have a mail list. We'd really appreciate any kind of reaching out that you'd like to do, and we'd love to have you come and participate in the in the modeling community that we're we're trying to build. <clears throat> so thank you very much for letting me speak, and I'm happy to take questions. I I'm back here to uh, moderate questions. So if anyone has a question for Sierra, I'm not sure if the participants are able to turn on their mic. So um, uh, I see that there are actually two questions in the Q&A. So uh, Sierra, do you want me to read those or can you see them? There's a Q&A tab. Oh, I see it. I see it here. It says some of the examples you used could also be used in an open refine talk. Does LinkML replace open refine or do these two tools work together. You know, I don't, I don't, I think I'd probably have to look up what open refine is. I don't, I'm not familiar with that. That's my bad, but I will look up that and get back to you. Um, I don't think LinkML uh, has any plans to replace open refine. It would be best to work together. Um, do you still need examples for protege for, for protege? Is that for open refine or for LinkML? And we always need examples for protege <laughs> uh, in LinkML. <clears throat> Thank you for the questions. Appreciate it. Hey, Tiffany, did you have a question? I do have a question. And thanks so much for a great presentation. And know me just to stick in a plug. Thanks for letting bioontologies be a part of this great pre presentation. So my question for Sierra is, um, this tool is obviously phenomenal in a number of ways, but when you are not but, and when you were talking about it, it, it piqued my interest of if you foresee this tool being able to incorporate inferences or predictions from ML pipelines, specifically I'm thinking of, let's say we're out of the deductive logic reasoning space, we're using a knowledge graph to predict new relationships between entities that might already exist in an ontology, but to, to use this tool to help formally define what those relationships might mean or to integrate them into an existing knowledge base. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, it seems like that would be almost like making instance data that mm -hmm. conforms to a model. And I think that's totally doable. Um, you know, it, it you would hopefully formalize those relationships in the model itself and then, you know, be able to describe the data that you're generating using those those modeling um, attributes that you've added. I, I, one of the slides that I didn't put together was our, our work in generating um, or using LinkML models to generate and uh, refine text presented from ChatGPT or OpenAI mm -hmm. um, uh, data sets. And there is a whole community getting built with LinkML where you can kind of pass in a LinkML model to ChatGPT and ask it to extract text from a, set, a corpus of data without any kind of like learning module built into it, right? So link LLMs do that so quickly now. And then it can return data in the format you've submitted with your LinkML model. And so it's really producing a lot of good results. Uh, there's still probably plenty of work to do there. Um, and uh, and you, we could have a whole other presentation on it, to be honest. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I think LinkML can support um, discovery as well as documentation for existing models. Awesome. Great answer. That was what I was hoping to hear, too. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I have a question, which is for, for those of us who are not really active coders, 
Um, is there any kind of like tools like user interfaces or other resources that might be helpful for, for using LinkedIn Oh yeah, I, I would definitely point to um, the tutorial on the, the slide that I showed and I can definitely share the slides somehow uh, with this platform to, to get those links. But, you know, the tutorials are sort of written in terms of, you, you know, you're just starting out, you have sort of basic level understanding of, of some of these concepts. And, um, you know, I mentioned it in the talk, there, there is a way to do schema development in a spreadsheet, in a Google Doc, for example. And we have tooling that takes that Google Doc and translates it into YAML. So, you know, we try to approach uh, model development as a, democr a democratizing process where we want to let every member of your organization contribute to a shared understanding of that model. Um, and we do that with adding tools, just like you said, for people at all levels of the organization. So you might have really complex uh, code, right? Python data classes, Java data classes, et cetera, um, that represent your model for folks that are software developers. You might have this spreadsheet that I talked about to represent the model for people that are more comfortable in that in that domain. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in that kind of a diverse ecosystem of serializations of your model, just reach out and we can help set up that uh, for you and your organization. <clears throat> okay, so I, I saw another question fly by. What's the next big upgrade you would want to implement if time and resources were a non-issue? That's a really good question. We just actually, on a recent LinkML community talk, went through all of our priorities for the next year. Um, and I think, uh, you know, two or three big areas of interest are um, refining our validation strategies so that you can really easily validate your data in all different serializations of the model. We're very interested in the AI revolution that's going on right now and being able to apply LinkML models, as I mentioned, to chat GPT outputs. Um, and, you know, we're also just really interested in um, evolving the, the basic maintenance of our, our system. So we're refactoring our test infrastructure to make onboarding new developers easier, easier to interpret tests and, and their outputs. Um, and you know a whole wealth of other stuff. <laughs> There's plenty of room for more development um, in this tool. So we really welcome you to contribute um, and we'll try to help you onboard if you want to uh, in a seamless and easy way. 